Welcome and um, good morning to you all. Um, I'm very pleased to um, introduce uh, two really good talks this morning. Um, this is the, the, uh, the, the, the latest in our monthly series of seminars with the um, UK International uh, Coronavirus Network. Um, as you will have seen, um, this talk is being recorded. It's rec being recorded so that it can be um, put on YouTube for um, international um, international well, and national um, uh, attention beyond the, the end of this particular um, uh, time slot. So I, I'm really pleased in a slight change to um, advertised uh, order. We're going to start with with uh, Jack Pilgrim. Uh, Jack is uh, is a um, veterinary graduate with masters in infectious disease in um, in epidemiology and completing his, his uh, PhD several years ago, um, uh, looking at uh, uh, symbiotic b uh, bacteria in biting midges um, and their role in, in uh, transmission of diseases to livestock. Um, he has uh, done a lot of work on on coronavirus and and has been looking at um, canine coronaviruses more recently. Um, He'll talk to you more about what he's actually uh, what he's actually doing. And I'm very pleased to um, introduce Jack's talk, looking at emerging variants of canine enteric coronaviruses associated with seasonal outbreaks of severe canine gastroenteric disease. Jack, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, James, uh, and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. So, so the work I'm going to be presenting to you today is entitled "Emerging Variants of." Canine enteric coronavirus associated with seasonal outbreaks of severe canine gastroenteric disease in the UK. And just to let you know that this is work that involves several collaborations between vets, clients, um, epidemiologists, statisticians, microbiologists, etc. And uh, my role in this is, is rather small, uh, although namely it's involved in the uh, genomic surveillance part of things. So there are two main canine coronaviruses in companion animals. The first one is a beta coronavirus, uh, which is part of the kennel cough complex. And the second is an alpha coronavirus, which um, causes vomiting and diarrhea. And this is an alpha coronavirus, which is closely related to feline coronavirus, which causes feline infectious peritonitis and a transmissible gastroenteritis virus, which is an enteric disease of pigs. Uh, and worryingly, there have been recent variants discovered uh, sporadically in humans. Uh, and these actually cause uh, pneumonias instead of enteric disease. Uh, but in the canine population, there are two main presentations. So these are self-limiting diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, and in, in puppies, we see a more severe form of the disease, often with co-infections with things like canine parvovirus. And this is uh, where canine coronavirus places um, on a wider phylogeny of coronaviruses. So a surveillance strategy uh, appeared in earnest in 2020 with help from SAVSNet, which is the small animal veterinary surveillance network set up at the University of Liverpool. And this uses both electronic health records and diagnostic samples to try and preempt outbreaks. So these plots here are Bayesian models, which aim to uh, uh, predict expected prevalences of certain main presenting complaints, which is this line here. So for example, in plot A, uh, which is uh, with the main com presenting complaint being gast gastroenteric symptoms, the shaded area is credible intervals. So any data points above the shaded area um, suggest a potential outbreak which is what we see uh, in January 2020. Uh, similarly, in plot B, we see uh, prescription um, patterns of meropicin, which is a veterinary anti drug. And, and again, we see um, an increase um, in meropicin prescriptions around the same time. Uh, and just for comparison, plot C shows expected uh, unobserved um, respiratory symptoms in dogs, which um, show no discrepancy. Uh, so looking to the diagnostic samples which we received, there seems to be three spikes of canine coronavirus around winter time. And this is in, uh, which suggests some sort of seasonality for canine coronavirus. 
And this is in comparison to canine parvovirus, which historically was a leading cause of puppy deaths uh, until a successful vaccine drive. And it's nice to see that these uh, cases remain stable and quite low. So looking at the national picture, there are clusters of, of gastroenteritis um, in Edinburgh, the Midlands and the Southwest. There was no specific hot, hot spot in the UK. And looking at uh, phylogenetics of the of the M gene of the virus, there was one predominating uh, perceived uh, variant here uh, and a couple of minor variants. And this was confirmed um, with phylogenomics. Uh, and the, the the main circulating strain was present across the UK. So fast forward to 2022, when a different coronavirus takes center stage. For some reason, there was increased media attention of coronaviruses around this time. Uh, in Yorkshire, there appeared to be uh, an outbreak of a dog vomiting bug, which seemed to be associated with walking dogs uh, along beaches. So there was early speculation that this um, outbreak was as a result of dogs coming into contact with washed up uh, marine animals, although this was unfounded. Um, and looking at the diagnostic samples from this year, we see similar prevalence of, of CCOV uh, uh, to, to the 2020 uh, prevalence. And then going back to this model, uh, at, at, a, at a national level, we do see uh, in, in, an increase above expected uh, prevalence of um, gastroenteric complaints, but they are with incredible intervals. Um, however, when we focus in Yorkshire, we do see data points outside of this credible interval region, suggesting that these media reports weren't unfounded. So I'm just taking you through the sort of workflow um, that I undertook as part of the 2022 outbreak work. So we received 150 diarrhea samples from suspected cases. Uh, around 50 of these were positive and Sanger sequenced um, at the end gene to again try and get some uh, idea of an updated national picture. And then a subsample of these were taken to a genomic workflow using a uh, sequence independent single prime amplification, which is a, an unbiased amplification uh, method designed to enrich viral sequences for detection. Uh, and then using Osdanapol technologies, uh, we were able to get consensus genome. Uh, after this, I then used um, what's known as uh, amplicon tiling. So this is effectively a multiplex PCR, which aims to tile across the genome. And it's a way of getting a lot of cheap genomes, basically, uh, compared to the CISPA method. And this was championed during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which allowed for a whole genome to be generated for about £10 per sample. So the idea of incorporating it into this project was to show that we could extrapolate these ideas to uh, beyond human viruses to, to veterinary viruses. Um, so when we did get the, the genomes, I then undertook family uh, genomics and uh, recombination detection in order to mask uh, areas which could interfere with um, inferences of, of ancestry. So similar to 2020, there was a, a main strain associated with the 2022 outbreak which is this dark purple area here. Um, initially, about two thirds of positive samples uh, were from this clade. However, um, we were later given further samples from Lincolnshire from a collaborator, which showed that the M gene diversity was actually greater than, than first anticipated. Um, but importantly, the 2020 and 2022 major variants um, were very closely related as, as would be uh, expected. So looking at a genomic level, uh, this is a, a genome similarity plot. Uh, the query is the, the main circulating variant in 2022 compared to the main and minor variants from 2020. Um, and as you can see, the core genome closely uh, mimics that um, of the uh, major variant from 2020 up until the spike gene, where we see this discrepancy, which uh, is likely a, a um, a recombinant um, event, and that was confirmed by a recombination uh, detection program. 
So masking this area, we got this tree, uh, which again showed that the, the main variant of 2020 was from the same lineage as uh, the main variant from 22. Uh, and it also showed proof of principle that the Ampicon styling method um, could be used uh, for genomic surveillance of canine coronavirus. So what's actually happening in the spike gene itself? Well, just to give you an idea about what these different shadings are, uh, this red and uh, these red and lilac leaves are feline and canine uh, coronavirus serotype one, which share a common ancestor, uh, and the the neighboring clade is serotype two, but this is split into two subclades. So here we have subclade two B, and here we have subclade two A. So the importance of this is subclade two B is associated with certain zoonotic events. So TGEV, which I mentioned before, is sort of arisen through zoonotic uh, of, um, transfer from a canine of a coronavirus, a canine coronavirus uh, infecting a pig. And similarly, the, the spillover variants uh, occurring in humans are from this subclade. So the major strain from 2020 is in 2B, uh, but the strains depicted by stars, which are the 2022 strains, uh, aren't. And we actually see this uh, the strange recombinant uh, spike um, gene here. Uh, and this 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 encircled here is the uh, the main circling invariant from 2022. So. Looking at the specific regions of the spike gene, uh, at the in the S1 region at the end terminal domain, uh, we see that dog 1022 is actually closely related to serotype 1 than serotype 2A and 2B. Uh, and this is interesting because a similar virus, A76, was shown to only be able to utilize K9 aminopeptidase uh, N compared to serotype 2 C cubs, which could also um, use the, the feline version. Um, of this uh, receptor. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, the significance of this is that um, it looks like the main circulating invariant from 2022 uh, has a narrow host range, potentially only affecting uh, dogs. So when we look at the ST region, which is responsible for cell fusion, we see that dog 1022 clusters with uh, the rest of serotype 2s. Um, and this is reminiscent of uh, A76, which where uh, researchers found a recombination event in the uh, S1 region. Uh, so what's the significance of this? Well, it appears that the main variants from 2020 and 2022 are, are similar, except for when it comes to the S gene. Uh, and the most parsimonious explanation of this is a, a recent co-infection of a recombinant serotype one or two strains. So this could either be a virus similar to the minus, minus circulating strain in 2020 or A76, and a virus similar to the major circulating strain in 2020. And so aside from this, uh, we need to expand our surveillance strategy to uh, wildlife because a, a new identical virus um, uh, the dog 720 was found uh, in raccoon dogs in China. Um, and so it, it could be the source of these uh, recombinants are actually um, in, in, in wildlife rather than in companion animals. And further to this, it shows that we need to move away from using single locus determinants of variants. Uh, and now that we do have these uh, accessible viral genomic techniques, these should be used to, to monitor these uh, recombination events. So going back to this uh, idea of spillover, what is the likelihood of the, the current circulating strains in the UK spilling over? Well, we know that in several different countries, uh, canine coronaviruses have affected uh, humans and caused pneumonia. And so uh, this, these appear to be independent spillover events in uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, the US and, and Haiti. And this seems to be associated again with the, S, the end terminal domain of the S1 region specifically these red areas here, which contain deletion. Now, these areas are associated with um, sialic acid co-receptor binding. And when this, um, uh, when this co-receptor binding um, is loosened, it appears that the tropism shifts from enteric to respiratory. So TGEV, um, although it is primarily an enteric disease, can also infect respiratory tissue. 
And so both the human ammonia strains and TBV have this deletion. Um, at the moment, the the CCOV two Bs that I've analysed don't have this deletion, so there appears to be no immediate zoonotic threat, but that could obviously change uh, in the future. And finally, I want to look at a, a case study of, of feline infectious parasititis in Cyprus last year. So feline coronavirus has, has two biotypes. Uh, first is enteric, which is sort of self-limiting and is spread through the fecal oral route. And the second is um, the FIP or sort of systemic form, um, which is more severe, can cause things like abdominal swelling, neurological symptoms and fever. But um, it has quite low transmission potential. And um, the significance of this is that the biotypes uh, historically have been able to switch from enteric to or enteric form to FIP form through mutations of the, of the virus in the cat. And in 2021 and 2022, there were only a handful of confirmed cases in Cyprus. Um, however, last year, this uh, there was a 40 fold increase, uh, which suggested something strange was happening. Um, not only that, the, the cases themselves were of the FIP form, so they, um, uh, there were a lot of uh, cases which had neurological symptoms, so there was a lot of the FIP biotype. And this seemed to be as a result of the recombination event between a, a canine coronavirus 2 and a feline coronavirus 1, where the spike gene from canine coronavirus 2 integrated into um, um, a feline coronavirus 1. Uh, and this seems to have led to uh, a virus which requires no biotype switch and uh, leads to onward transmission. Now, this is not entirely confirmed. This is just based on epidemiological data. But overall, this is quite concerning. It shows that these recombination events can lead to new uh, sort of pathogen characteristics of these coronaviruses. Um, so to conclude, uh, we identified a new pattern of seasonal gastroenteric disease associated with canine uh, coronavirus. These variants appear to be uh, evolving not just by point mut mutation, but also by recombination. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any current zoonotic risk in the UK, but that could change in the future. And uh, we need to extend our surveillance efforts to, to wildlife uh, in, in order, to, uh, in order to, to preempt some of these um, recombination events being seen. Uh, and finally, we need to make use of the uh, innovations developed during COVID-19 um, to extend extend these to better new viruses. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank all of our collaborate, collaborators involved in this work. And uh, thank you all for listening. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions you might have. Jack, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating and um, really interesting to see um, so much uh, new data in there. 